And good morning, everybody. My name's Nick Schatz, one of the pastors here, and going to bring a message from the Bible for you today. We're going to be in Matthew 13, if you'd like to turn along. Uh, we're only looking at three verses. It's actually two parables of Jesus, but they're both very short and very similar. So only three verses. We'll put them on the screen, but you can turn there if you like. Uh, hey, thanks, man. And uh, before we get started, I just want to pray with you for one of our missions teams that is going out this week. Uh, our teenagers have been uh, a part of two different missions trips this summer. They just got back from Kentucky a couple of weeks ago on a disaster relief trip. And then there's a, I think there's a couple of overlapping kids on both teams. But then there's a separate group of teenagers that is leaving tomorrow, getting set up in Harrisburg with an elementary school that uh, we've had a really cool privilege of having a good relationship with over the last few years, Downey Elementary in the Allison Hill area of uh, Harrisburg. And so they're going to be there doing a vacation Bible school, kind of Bible studies and things like that with the kids. So really cool opportunity. We have teenagers and some adult leaders going down. Uh, they're actually going to be staying overnight in Harrisburg for the entire week. Uh, just really inundating themselves in, in the, the community there. So uh, just pray with me. Feel free to pray on, on your own as well as I'm speaking or just listen to me pray and let's pray for this team. Uh, Father, I want to pray for our youth group, uh, for the teenagers that are heading down to Harrisburg uh, tomorrow to get set up and then Tuesday through Friday are going to be doing this vacation Bible school, these Bible studies and uh, games and activities with the kids and the, com uh, the people in the, of the community in that area at Downey Elementary. I want to pray for the kids, that they would hear the gospel, that they would make decisions that alter their life, and that they would also just make memories, positive memories of uh, seeing Jesus' followers and enjoying themselves, that these would be good memories for them to keep with them. I want to pray for our teenagers, that you would fill them with your spirit, uh, that you would give them energy and a passion for what they are doing this next week. And I would pray for the community. This is just a small little thing that we're doing for this, this uh, large and diverse city of Harrisburg. But I pray that this, this one week that people from Hershey Free get to be there, that it would make a positive impact on the community, that the relationships would be built, rapport would be built, and so on and so forth. So Father, go with our youth as they head out on this trip. We pray this to you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, and by the power of the Spirit. Amen. All right, well, thank you for praying with me, and continue to pray for them as they come to mind this next week. So today, hopefully you uh, have arrived at Matthew 13. We're going to be talking about commitment issues. Believe it or not, commitment issues. Uh, we live in a society where it's easy to have commitment issues. Streaming services have trouble keeping people remaining on their platform, whether it's a music streaming service or a Netflix, something like that. They have problems keeping their subscribers. There's a lack of commitment uh, on their part. Employers have a problem keeping good workers at their company. Maybe you're a small business owner and you've experienced this. Ah, I keep losing employers to employees to uh, other companies. Companies have problems and troubles keeping clients uh, attached to them. I'm part of the problem. I am a proud millennial, so if you ask me to RSVP for something, it's probably not going to happen. I might be busy on that for that hour in two months. I don't know. Uh, if you are a dentist, you can save the spiel. I'm, I'm not going to floss. It's just I've tried. Two weeks after my dentist appointment, I floss pretty consistently, and then it's just it's not going to happen. So save the speech. I know it's better for my health. I know I'm going to live a longer, happier life if I floss, but it's probably not going to happen, right? So all of, us, all of us experience commitment issues. We have commitment issues. We work with people, interact with people, clients, whatever, that have commitment issues. Uh, this last week, I called up a teacher. Uh, she's actually a former teacher. She recently got a new job, but she was a teacher that attends our church here. And I asked her, hey, do you ever encounter, uh, when you were a teacher, uh, commitment issues? And she said, oh my goodness, let me tell you. Uh, every teacher on the face of this planet has these little lament sessions with all the other teachers. Oh, if only the students would do their homework, they could get that scholarship, they could, you know, their life would be better, they would be set up for, if only these parents would read my email, right? I'm, if you're a teacher, you have experienced commitment issues and you gripe about it with the other teachers. Why don't these parents care? And, you know, you, you go through that. And I also called up a, a therapist, he's a friend of mine, and I said, hey, do you, you ever have issues with commitment issues with your clients? And he told me this great story. He said, Nick, I gotta tell you, most people that come see me, if they would just go to ChatGTP and type in their issue, they would get a treatment plan that would be just as good as seeing me. Maybe not just as good, but they, they, would, they, would, they would receive information about what to do about their issue, and if they would follow that, they'd be fine. But they come see me week after week, and I tell them what to do. I try to give them a treatment plan to make their lives better, and man, if they would just commit to it. I mean, so if you're a counselor, if you're a therapist, if you're a financial advisor, 
If people would just save their money and over the course of time, if you're a coach, I don't care what you do for your profession, I'm sure you encounter people with commitment issues. Commitment issues are everywhere. Everywhere we look, there are people who, they, they, they are toe dippers. They want to dip their toes in what is best for them, but they just don't want to jump all in and commit. Everywhere you look, there are toe dippers. There, there are shoulder shruggers, you know. Uh, I don't know, I might come. I don't know, I might agree with you. I'm just shrug their shoulders. They just will not commit. Non-committal people, I, I don't know if I'll show up. I'll think about it. I'll put it in my schedule. I'll let you know. I mean, we, we live, we are surrounded by people that have commitment issues. And if we're honest, we all have commitment issues of our own. I mean, I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but how many of you floss, <laughs> right? You have issues keeping your diet and, and doing your workout schedule, and man, if I could only get to bed before 1030, that would be great. But all of us have commitment issues. We interact with commitment issues everywhere we go. There are people with commitment issues. Even when it comes to matters of faith, even when it comes to our faith and to Christianity, people lack commitment. There was this recent study done uh, back in 2015 by the Navigators. They did this major study on discipleship, and they interviewed various church leaders across the country. You know, thousands of people were a part of this study. And church leaders concluded that lack of commitment, those are the exact words, lack of commitment is the biggest obstacle to Christians' discipleship. There's another uh, uh, leader in missiology, Ed Stetzer. He's the dean of Wheaton College. He says that the largest category of Christians in America are nominal Christians. If you look at all the people who identify, they self-identify as Christians, the largest segment of those people are what he calls nominal Christians, meaning they are Christian in name only, but their faith does not work its way out as the primary priority of their life. According to Gallup polls, very recent Gallup polls, nearly 70% of Americans identify as Christian, but only 20% of them attend church on a weekly basis. The Barna Group surveyed Christian families and found that 42% of practicing, practicing Christian households do not talk about faith together, do not read the Bible together, do not pray together with any regularity. So almost half of practicing Christian families do not have any kind of de regular devotional habits together. Furthermore, every pastor that you talk to will tell you that nowadays the average church attender attends maybe once per month. Uh, all pastors go to these different seminars and cohorts and conferences and things like that. And it's regular for us to talk about regular attenders and irregular attenders, which drives me nuts. What is an irregular attender? It sounds like an oxymoron. It's like an irregular Christian and a regular Christian. I mean, commitment issues, whether it's your work, whether it's your personal life, commitment issues are everywhere, even when it comes to matters of faith. And believe it or not, Jesus encountered regularly people that had commitment issues. He encountered people that were non-committal. They wanted to dip their toes. They shrugged their shoulders at what he said. They were non-committal when it came to embracing his message. He had this life-altering, world-altering message that he called the kingdom of heaven that we're going to talk about. And people would, oh, okay, <laughs> shrug their shoulders at it and didn't want to jump all in. There were three different ways that people responded to Jesus' primary message, which is the kingdom of heaven. Three ways. Number one, some became a follower. There were others who became haters. And lastly, there were some who stayed non-committal. And you can see these responses all through the Gospels as you track the ministry of Jesus. All right, there were a few that wanted to become followers. Man, this is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. He's the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to devote my life to him. I mean, there were people who became followers, disciples, apostles. There were lots of others who became haters, the Pharisees, the scribes, various politicians, Herod thought that Jesus was trying to form a coup by what he was seeing, tried to take him out. Jewish teachers thought that Jesus was leading people astray, tried to take him out or dismiss him or uh, subtly get him crucified. There were fortune tellers who were scared that Jesus was stealing business from them because they were using manipulation to mess with people's hearts with their fortune telling uh, deals. And like the great relationship expert of our day, Taylor Swift has said, haters are going to hate, hate. So some people wanted to follow him. Some people uh, hated him. Yeah, I like this quote from Tim Keller. He passed away recently, the late Tim Keller. Jesus simply cannot simply be liked. You either kill him or you crown him the Lord of your life. These are the two options. If you understand Jesus' message, his mission, and what Jesus was about and why he came, if you understand him, you either hate him or you want to follow him and give him your life. Those are the two options. Those are the two options. I appreciate that. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. I would add a third category. There are those who are non-committal. They lack commitment. They, like, they, they actually do like him. But I would argue it's not because, it's because they really don't understand. You see, here's the difference between these three kinds of people, followers, haters, and non-committal believers. Those who choose to follow Jesus 
they understand his mission. They get it. Those who hate Jesus, oh, they understand his mission. And they don't like it. Those who are noncommittal, they don't understand what he's here for. Oh, he talks about love. He talks about kindness. Yeah, that's good. No, no, you, you don't. Sure, that's part of it. But if, if you understand his mission, you either hate him or you love him. If you really understand what he's, what he's all about and what his mission was all about, you love him or you hate him. So Jesus had several ways of interacting with the crowds, the flocks of people that would come here. The crowds that would come to hear him teach, but they weren't interested in applying his teaching to their life. The, the flocks of people that would come to see a miracle. They wanted to see a miracle or have their mother-in-law healed or whatever, but they didn't want to apply what they were hearing. And they went back to normal life the next day. Those who wanted to come and see. a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. The next parable is almost identical. It just changes up the characters a little bit. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls, and when he found one of great value, he went and sold all of his other pearls, all of his other jewelry. He sold everything he had and bought that pearl. Here's the essence of both of these parables. They're, they're almost identical. They teach the same thing. Is that if you understand Jesus' message, you will either devote your entire life to his message or you'll walk away if you really understand it. If you don't understand it, you might be noncommittal and, yeah, yeah, Christians are cool. But, but if you understand it, you're either going to give him everything or you're going to walk away because it's ridiculous. So here's the lesson for today. I don't think anybody in here wants to be nominal. Otherwise, this is a great waste of your time, <laughs> right? I don't think anybody in here wants to be a nominal Christian. You want to give him everything you have. And so here's what I want you to walk away with. Following Jesus is a never-ending loop of applying this parable. Following Jesus is a, never, is a lifelong process of stubbing your toe and turning around and finding out you just stumbled across something worth giving your life to. Following Jesus is a never-ending process of searching for a deeper relationship with God. And you find it, and, and all, the, all the baggage, all the priorities you have in your life are just trash. Just, they're not worth anything compared to this, this life of following Jesus. Following Jesus is a never-ending loop of applying this parable to your life and realizing, oh, there's more baggage and, and messed up priorities that I had. That I, 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 I got to have this treasure. I got to have this pearl. It's a never-ending process of applying this. Now, so here's what I want us to do. Before we dig more into this message, here's what I want you to do. I want you to whisper a prayer, okay? But, and and pray, pray your own words. Uh, I'm going to give you some prompts. I just want you to, you can close your eyes if you want. You don't have to, whatever. Uh, but I want you to just kind of whisper this prayer in your mind, something like this. Uh, Father, what area of my life do you want me to go and sell so that I can, so that I can live this life? Just, just pray something like that. Father, what sacrifice do you want me to make for the kingdom? What investment do you want me to make for eternity? What's, what's some area of my life? Uh, Holy Spirit, I invite you to just kind of poke me and say, look, that, that right there, that needs to be sold so that you can have this. What, what area of, you, of my life do you want me to give up so that I can have this pearl, this treasure? Pray something similar to that. Did you pray that prayer? Okay. You can keep praying if you want. I won't be offended. <laughs> I'll assume you're sleeping or praying. That's fine. <laughs> so these two parables, let's, go, let's, get, let's get back to the text today. These two parables, they start with the same words. The kingdom of heaven is like yada, yada. The kingdom of heaven. So what is he talking about when he talks about the kingdom of heaven? I mean, this isn't Settlers of Catan. This isn't Lord of the Rings. I mean, what are we talking about when you talk about the kingdom of heaven? In this chapter of Matthew, in chapter 13 of Matthew alone, the kingdom is mentioned 12 different times. Here's a splattering of it. Okay, verse 11. The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, verse 19, 
The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed seed in his field, verse 24. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, verse 31. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast, verse 33. Good seed stands for the people of the kingdom, verse 38. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin, verse 41. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, verse 43. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. The kingdom of heaven is like a net. A disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house, verse 52. Thirteen times just in this chapter, this, I, this, this, this word kingdom comes up. What are we talking about? And that's just in this chapter. Throughout all of Matthew, the word kingdom applies, uh, used in this way, comes up 55 different times. The book of Matthew has 28 chapters. 25 of those chapters mention the kingdom. And that's just Matthew. All four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mention the kingdom 126 times. It's called the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the Father, the kingdom of Jesus, or sometimes just the kingdom. And these writers that speak of the kingdom, they talk about the kingdom in different ways. The kingdom is near. The kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is coming. The kingdom draws near. The kingdom is entered. The kingdom is proclaimed. The kingdom is desired. It's anticipated. It's a gift. It's a possession. It's a treasure. It's an inheritance. The kingdom is found. The kingdom is purchased. The kingdom is prepared. The kingdom grows. The kingdom permeates like yeast. There are keys to the kingdom. There are people that suffer for the kingdom. Well, what are we talking about here? What is the kingdom? Jesus talks about the kingdom incessantly, but he's always using parables. He speaks of it vaguely. What, what is a kingdom? This is a democracy. We don't even think about kingdoms and kings. Like, like what, are we, what is he even talking about? Do you know? I don't know. I was hoping you did. No, I'm just kidding. We'll talk about this. So what is, what is the kingdom of heaven? The, I, I love images. They help me. And so the, the, best, the best images that I could find that explain what the kingdom is, this comes from Tim Mackey and the Bible Project, is that the Bible speaks, obviously, of two different realms, two different uh, worlds, uh, just e briefly speaking. There's, there's heaven. Of course, heaven is good. It's, it's safe. It's, it's righteous. And then there's earth. Earth is not always good. It can, be, it can be evil. It can be dangerous. It can be unsafe. It can be bad. At times, there's heaven and there's earth. And there's this space in between. Let's go to the next slide here. When, when Jesus came to this earth, he kind of intersected the two of these things. He brought heaven down to earth. And so the kingdom of heaven is this. The kingdom of heaven is when you have the values of heaven, the priorities of heaven, the, the things of heaven enter earth. The way that things ought to be in heaven is how it is lived out on earth. And so Jesus lived as people would live in heaven. And he acted that out on earth. And what he is trying to do is start these little mini, the line, little mini pockets of heaven all throughout that we call churches, that we call bodies of believers, that we call Christians that are spread out through the earth. That is the kingdom. It's when the way things ought to work in heaven happens here on earth. This is the kingdom. It's, it's the way things ought to be in God's kingdom happening right here. It's life in the purple. It's life in the purple. Sometimes we call it the upside-down kingdom because it's the opposite of the way things work here on earth. Jesus wasn't lifted up to a throne. He was lifted up onto a cross. Jesus doesn't gain authority with power but with humility. Like, life isn't supposed to work that way here. It does in heaven. It doesn't work that way here. But Jesus lived as if he was in heaven while he was here. We preach a message of Christ crucified, which is the biggest oxymoron of all history. All right, the word Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is a title. It means the Messiah. It's, it's this authoritative title. Christ crucified. Those should not be in the same sentence, right? The last will be first. The greatest on earth is least in the kingdom of heaven. It is, it's completely backwards to the way things ought to work on earth, and it's not supposed to work. But when you look back, there's no more Rome. I mean, Rome still exists, but the, but the Roman Empire's gone. There's no more Caesar, but there's still a Jesus, and there's still a church, churches all over the world, right? The cross was supposed to be a symbol of violence and of intimidation, but all of you have these crosses around your necks and in your earrings, and you got them posted on your wall, and you got tattoos of crosses. Like, crosses have become a symbol of peace, even though they were meant to be a symbol of violence. Like, it's, it's all upside down. This is the kingdom of heaven. And it's hard to understand because... It's happening now, but it's also not yet here, <laughs> right? The kingdom has begun, but it's not started. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Everything, everything's upside down. It's because, it's because we're still here on earth, but we're meant to live as though we're in heaven. It's, it's when the two intersect. It's when we live in the purple. That's, that's what the kingdom of heaven is. Somebody once was interviewing uh, Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard, he, he's passed away a while back, but uh, he was a prolific writer and teacher, and he spoke a lot about the kingdom of heaven. And so somebody in an interview once asked him, Dallas, what, what is the kingdom of heaven? Is it about going to heaven when I die? And Dallas said, no, no, no. The kingdom of heaven is about going to heaven before you die. It's about living out as if you're already, living out the, whatever would be important in heaven, the way that you would live out your life in heaven 
living out right here. It's not going to make sense <laughs> because that's not how things work here. But it's, it's this little pocket of purple where heaven and earth intersect. This is the kingdom of heaven. And the point of these parables, that Jesus has all these parables about the kingdom, the purpose of these two parables is to point out that you can't be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and dip your toes in the water. You can't stand in the shallow end. You've got you to jump all in, otherwise you're not a part of the kingdom. You can't halfway be humble. or <laughs> like You can't halfway do this stuff. You've got to be all in. You can't, you can't be a member of the kingdom and just kind of shrug your shoulders like, yeah, yeah, I'll love people. I mean, it doesn't, no, it doesn't, you've got to be all in. The whole point of the parable is you've got to sell everything you own because otherwise you can't afford the pearl. You've got to sell everything you own, otherwise you can't, you can't buy the field. It's, you've got to be all in. That's the whole purpose of the parable. You can't be a toe dipper, a shoulder shrugger, or a non-committal person. And listen, I could stand up here. If I had more time, I would do it. I, I could stand up here and tell you story after story of people who have lived in the purple and, and literally given everything. Classmates of mine that I met when I lived in Dallas who they, they graduated with a good degree. They could have lived in the States and, you know, had a good middle-class lifestyle or whatever, and they moved and, and devoted their life to serving people in, in Haiti or East Africa. I mean, like some of the least desirable, they went to some of the least desirable places in the world because they, they had a vision for the kingdom lived out in those areas. I could tell you story after story of, of wealthy business people who had, who had everything that most of us want, and they left their jobs, they sold their homes, and they went to seminary to become a pastor, and they're never going to make what they were making before. And they just, they just did it without even thinking about it hardly. I could tell you story after story of happy middle-class people. They had the yard and the fireplace and the kids. I mean, they, they had all this, everything that, we, everything that most of the world dreams about, and they left it all to, they just left everything. To, to serve the kingdom and to give their life in Christian service. I could tell you all kinds of stories like this. And most people think they're crazy, but, but I know why they did it. And you know why they did it. You know why they did it. It's because they were all about the kingdom. Now, it sounds crazy to most people, but it's because they had a vision for the kingdom. And they were traveling. They were people just like you and me who were traveling, and they rolled their ankle in a hole, and they turned around to curse the farmer. Who leaves a hole in the middle of a... Oh, this is worth everything. And when you understand the value of what's in the ground, your little house, your little dental plan, your little Tacoma, none of that matters. <laughs> it's all about the kingdom. None of that matters. When you, when, you, when you realize what you rolled your ankle over, when you realize what you just saw on the shelf, you walk by the shelf, wait, what was, what was that? That's worth more than everything I got at home. You'll give everything. Who cares about your Tacoma? <laughs> right? You'll give it all. That's the point of the parable. That's the point. But... We're not here to talk about all those super Christians, okay? <laughs> We're not here to talk about them. We're here to talk about you. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with this parable? I, hope, I, I mean, I, I would imagine you're not here because you want to be someone in the crowd that goes, wow, that was good teaching. All right, back to the farm. I mean, no, you, well, what are you going to do with this, with this parable of the kingdom? Following Jesus is a never-ending loop of realizing that, oh, I have more baggage and, and misplaced priorities than I thought. I've got to get rid of all that now. Yes. It's a never-ending loop of applying this parable. I hope this parable causes you to stub your toe so bad <laughs> and turn around and see what in the world you just kicked in the field. I hope that this parable causes you to roll your ankle or see the pearl and, and give up something for the kingdom. All right? And here's where we need to start. Here's what I want you to do. Remember you prayed that prayer. That was a dangerous prayer. I should have told you that before. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to just pick one area of your life, just, just one area of your life that you need to sell all and invest in the kingdom. Pick one area of your life. Okay, maybe, maybe it's your devotional habits. Maybe you don't have a, a regular habit of spending time with the Lord with Bible reading and prayer. If you, if you don't have that habit in your life, then that's, that's your application, okay? You don't have to think of an application. I just gave it to you. That's your application. You need to abandon your pillow and pursue a relationship with God. 15, 20 minutes a day. Okay? Maybe it's your Sundays. Maybe you don't make uh, the, the, attending the gathered church on a regular basis a priority. Maybe that's, maybe that's your, uh, your application today. You need to abandon the excuses that you come up with on every other week basis and just make, make the gathered church, the thing that Jesus died for, a priority in your life. Maybe it's your wallet. Maybe it's your sex life. Maybe it's isolation in your life. Maybe it's, maybe it's a growth plan and maturity in your life. I don't, I don't know what it is, but I want you to think of one area of your life where you've got to go sell it all because you've got to have, you gotta have this. Give it all to the kingdom. Think of one area of your life. And I'm going to come back to this, so it's not like, okay, if I just get through this part. No, you're going to have to think of something. 
all right? I'm going to make you think of something. I don't know what your application is, but you pray for the Holy Spirit to poke you. Let's read this passage again, Matthew 13, 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Again, the purpose of this is to abandon everything. All your possessions, your pursuits, your plans, and to be a part of the kingdom. I want to show you a neat story that I found. This is from the LA Times. Here's, here's kind of a clipping or a screenshot of, of the article. According to the LA Times, there was a man named Roy Wettstein that lived this parable in a very literal way. Okay. Roy was a rock collector who lived in Texas. He went out to Arizona one day to visit with his father. His father was ill, so he took his two sons out to visit uh, their grandpa, his dad. And while he was in Arizona, he heard about a rock and gemstone show that was happening in Tucson. So he decided to spend an afternoon there, went to the, to the rock show. Not a rock concert, but a rock, I don't know, they show rocks. I didn't know if such a thing existed, but in Tucson they do. Before he headed out, Roy's two sons said, Hey, Dad, if you find a cool rock, can you get it for us? And each son was able to scrounge up five bucks. So one son gave him five bucks, another son gave him five bucks. Roy took the $10 and stuffed them in his pocket, and he went off to the rock and gemstone show. As he was walking around, he passed a table where there was a potato-sized stone that was sitting inside of a Tupperware container. It's like a plastic, I don't even know what Tupperware is. It's like a plastic container, right? And instantly he knew that this rock did not belong in a plastic container. (laughs) He instantly knew there was something special about this rock. There was a sign on the table that said, any rock for $15. He's got 10. (laughs) So he goes to the guy behind the counter. He picks it up. You want 15 bucks for this? And the guy says, ah, you can have it for 10 bucks. It's not as pretty. You can have it for 10 bucks. So Roy, his hands are shaking, I bet. <laughs> he pulls out his $10 from his tons and pays the man and walks out, makes a, makes a beeline for the door to get out of there. It turns out, here's a picture of the rock he bought. It turns out that he had bought the world's largest star sapphire. It is over 1,500 carats and worth over $2 million that he bought at this rock and gemstone show. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. This probably isn't going to happen to you, so you can forget about that. But hey, here, here, here's your application today. Following Jesus is a never-ending loop. It's, it's a lifelong process of stubbing your big toe, of rolling your ankle in a field and turning over. Who leaves a hole in the middle of a field? And you realize what you just stepped over. It's a never-ending process of thinking that you've given everything to the kingdom and realizing, oh, I've got all this baggage back here. I actually got to sell this because I got to have this pearl. It's a never-ending loop of applying these two parables, right? And so here's why Jesus tells a story. He's been traveling, he's been speaking, he's been healing people. Crowds have been gathering and the crowds get bigger and bigger. Everywhere he goes, people hear about him, they want to come. And there's all these people that want to come, they want to dip their toes in the water. They just, they just don't get it. You don't dip your, you, you don't, nobody, nobody walks by a treasure and goes, meh. Like nobody does that. Nobody who understands jewelry, I don't understand jewelry, so I would do this, but nobody who understands jewelry would walk through and see a, and see a sapphire like that or, or see a pearl on a shelf and go, Oh, cool, that's like worth more money than I'll ever earn, my kids will ever earn, my grandkids will ever earn, all combined. Okay, like nobody does that. If you get it, if you understand the kingdom, if you really get it, if you don't understand it, you can can become a nominal Christian. If you get it, you can't do that. You either hate the message or you follow him and give him everything. And so here's what I want you to do today is think of one area that in which you're going to apply this message, okay? Okay. It is unreasonable for me to expect that you're going to listen to me talk for 25 minutes and, I don't know, go sell everything. <laughs> like, I, I just, I don't expect that. Maybe I should, I don't know. I, I don't think I'm that good of a speaker, so I don't think that's going to happen today. I, don't ex- I have low expectations that anyone in here is going to literally go sell everything you own and give to the poor. I, may, maybe you should, I don't know. Uh, I have low expectations that someone in here is going to go home and write up a letter of resignation and quit your job and go into full-time Christian service. Maybe you should, I don't know, but I, I don't expect that to happen. I have low expectations that a bunch of you in here are going to go home and like get rid of all your TVs and devices downstairs and turn your basement into a prayer room. I mean, maybe you should do that, maybe you will do that, but I, I, don't, I, I, just, I have low expectations that'll happen. But here's what I do expect. 
Here's what I want you to do. For real, like for real. Go ahead and get out a piece of paper and a pen, okay? I did it, I did it this morning. Uh, go ahead and get out your phone. Open up the Notes app, Evernote, OneNote. Open up your email. Open up something where you can take a note. You've been, you, you prayed at the beginning. I told you to think about your own application. Here's what I want you to do. Go, go ahead. Go ahead and do it. I'll wait a second. Nobody's moving. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Yeah, get out your phone. Open up your email. Get out a piece of paper, you know, whatever, however you want to take notes. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to write down one area of your life. I hope you just stub your toe. I want you to stub your toe and say, okay, there's one, er there's, there's one thing in my life that I need to sell, Metaf you know, meta not metaphysically, metaphorically, to sell so that I can live this out. And write that down. It might be a sin that you need to confess and forsake. It might be a spiritual habit that you need to start. It might be a sacrifice that you need to make. It might be a step of faith that you've been hesitant to take, but... The Lord's been nagging you about it. Just write down, what, what, is your, what, what do you need to go sell for this pearl? What do you need to go abandon for the kingdom of heaven? <clears throat> Maybe it's an idol that you need to burn. Maybe it's a practice that you need to start. Maybe it's a donation that you need to make. Maybe it's a relationship you need to make right. Maybe it's someone you need to share the gospel with. Maybe it's an attitude that you need to confess and turn around. I know what mine is. I wrote down two because I'm a mess, okay? <laughs> I wrote down two things because that's me. I wrote down something this morning. What are you, you going to write down? What are you going to email to yourself? What are you going to put in your OneNote? What are you going to put in your Reminders app? The majority of people in the United States identify as Christians, but statistics clearly show that only a fraction of them even know what they just tripped over. I know you don't want to be a toe dipper, because you wouldn't be here. This is a massive waste of time if you're not committing to the faith. This is a massive waste of your time if you're not committed. N none of you want to be shoulder shruggers. Eh, man, kingdom of heaven, sure. N none of you want to do, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Otherwise you wouldn't be uh, looking on, you wouldn't have listened to me for 25 minutes online if, if that was you. So, what are you going to do? What, what do you need to sell, uh, figuratively speaking, for the kingdom? Two more minutes. I'm going to get two more minutes of your time. Some of you are listening, and you're not a Christian, okay? Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe you're exploring the faith. Maybe you're open to it. Maybe you're a seeker. You're not sure you're a Christian. Or maybe you, you follow a different religion. You are an atheist, an agnostic, and I'm just, I'm just uh, blown away and, and so happy that, that you've tuned in online or that you're, you're here in person listening. I'm just... I'm just very impressed that you are seeking out Christianity in that way. So if you're not a Christian, here's, here's, what, I want you to, here's what I want you to hear. The, the one difference between these two parables, they're almost identical. The one difference is that one of the characters is a traveler, and he, he's not looking for anything. He just, he rolls his ankle, he, he stumbles over something in a field and realizes, oh, what, look at this. And so maybe that's you. Maybe somebody sent you this link, sent you, and you weren't expecting this, like whatever, I'm in town, I'm with family, they told me to come to church, whatever, I'll go. Maybe you just kind of stumbled on this and it's making you think. Or maybe you're like the merchant. The, the, the difference in the two is that the merchant was looking. He was searching for something. He was a seeker, and he found it. And it was worth it. Was, I, I found it. I know this is the truth, right? I don't know if, if, you're, if you're seeking or if you just kind of stumbled in here and don't really want to be here. I don't know. It's, I don't know which character you are. But, but maybe that's you. Maybe you're not a Christian, but this has intrigued you. Here's what I want you to do. Uh, I, I would love for you to just explore this a little more. And so I've, I've got a stack of these. I've had, I've had these for several months. I've got a stack of these books. It's called The Doubter's Guide to Jesus. And I'd love to give you a copy. Um, you can take it. We, we can talk about it later. Or you can never talk to me again. I don't, that's up to you, right? Uh, if you're watching online, I'll mail it to you, whatever. Uh, you don't have to pay me for it. I don't know what I paid for it. The price isn't on the back. I bought a stack of them for the purpose of giving away. Um, every now and then someone tries to give me a book and I feel bad. Oh, should I pay? And you don't need, I don't even know what I paid for them, okay? I, I bought them for the purpose of giving away. It's called A Doubter's Guide to Jesus. Uh, and it goes through what different people have said about Jesus that lived in those times. Not Bible writers, but like historians and politicians. Like what, what other people said about the miracles he was doing. Like it's really interesting. So if you'd love to just learn a little bit more about what other people outside of the Bible said about Jesus and what Jesus said about himself, if you want to learn about that, I've got, I've got a stack in my office. So uh, if you're not a Christian, if you're exploring it, I'd love to give you this, give you one in my office. I'll send you one if you're online. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find. Just email me. And uh, I just think that'd be cool if you explored this and I, I could be a, a part of you exploring. But before we finish, 
Let's read this passage together. Would you all stand with me as we read out loud these two parables together? Here we go. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Thank you for reading that with me. Before you leave today, I just want to remind you that you are not being dismissed. I don't dismiss you, but I will send you. You are not dismissed, but you are sent to take Jesus' teaching about the kingdom seriously. You are being sent to be like a merchant looking on the lookout for ways to live out the kingdom of heaven. You are not dismissed, but you are sent to follow a lifelong process of rolling your ankle and realizing you have more baggage and priorities than you realize that need to be gotten rid of to pursue this kingdom. You are not dismissed, but you are sent. Thank you.